we are living in a critical moment in history where our global society is confronted with seemingly insurmountable challenges. From extreme concentration of wealth and power into fewer and fewer hands, to our inability to manage the pandemic, reverse climate change, and regulate big tech. But why do these challenges seem so insurmountable? Is it possible that our thinking has been trapped in a box? That we are failing to see certain possibilities that are right in front of us? Our institutions are trying to serve each of the various communities and individuals, trying to connect all the dots, but only in a constrained and boxed in way. In trying to use new technologies to only help individuals or specific groups achieve fixed determined goals, they end up leaving many communities underserved and many important issues to fall by the wayside. In order to address all of these different issues, we need to reach outside the box. Instead of focusing only on achieving specific individual or collective goals, we need tools that facilitate communication and consensus. We need systems that help us form shared goals. Fortunately, there are innovators who are working both inside and outside of government, developing these new tools and systems for making group decisions, governing shared resources, and building tomorrow's democratic infrastructure. This culture, known as civic technology, is inspiring many people to explore the possibilities of how we might co-create and transform our society from one that is ill-suited to present and future challenges to one that makes a radically egalitarian and participatory future within reach. In this program, you will hear from extraordinary leaders like Audrey Tang, the Digital Minister of Taiwan, about how by embracing new forms of democracy and social technology, Taiwan was able to tackle the pandemic in unprecedented and creative ways, and how particular philosophical underpinnings lie at the heart of the socio-technological innovations. You will also hear from civil society leaders who are at the forefront of such progress and how they manage to make it all happen. This is Radical Exchange, a new era of democracy. Hey everyone, welcome to the 2021 Radical Exchange Conference from myself, Glenn Weil, and my daughter, Talia Audrey Weil. We're really excited to be welcoming you all to this conference. For Talia, more than for me, we desperately need a new era of democracy. Today, more than ever, the forces shaping all of our lives are at scales that don't match with the usual ways we governed ourselves. We have climate change ravaging our world at a global scale. We have rivers being depleted across many countries. We've got networks of software and production that snake their way around the world. We don't have the capacity to govern those things democratically because our institutions aren't shaped to meet the demands of the problems that we face. What Radical Exchange is really trying to do is to build tools that make possible all the richness of the democratic interactions we'd have in a town hall or a club open to us at those scales in that flexible way. So that when Talia grows up, she will live in a world that's much more democratic than the world that we know, not one where democracy is receding behind the forces of global commerce and bureaucratic organization. to a Radical Exchange talk where we are beyond honoured to have with us the Taiwanese Digital Minister Audrey Tang and historian Joe Gouldy 
to discuss Taiwan's civic technologies, how these technologies have been deployed by its citizens, and what that means for Taiwanese democracy. I'll be the moderator for today's talk. My name is Rosa O'Hara, and I'm a staff writer with Noema magazine. At Noema, we cover some really interesting topics to do with philosophy, reimagining democracy, and so forth. We've published quite a bit on Taiwan that our readers have really had an appetite for. Taiwan is such a fascinating, complicated place, a tiny nation that is highly technologically mature, and still such a young democracy that has been so successful at getting its citizens involved in the democratic process. So I'm really thrilled to be moderating today. Before I introduce our two wonderful guests, I'd like to lay out the themes that we'll be discussing today. We'll be talking about how Taiwan has had what many would call a very successful response to COVID and how Taiwan's population has helped out in this success by developing civic technologies like different types of apps to track and combat COVID, which have played such a crucial role in the country's pandemic response. We'll also talk about Taiwan's participatory democracy, the high level of transparency within its government, and the philosophical underpinnings of what makes civic technology and democratic participation so universal in Taiwan. We'll also explore the historical context in which these innovations have emerged and how Taiwan's unique synthesis of Eastern and Western values have put it at the global forefront for government innovation. With those themes in mind, we have two people who are very qualified to speak on them. We have a hacker and a historian, both of whom have dedicated themselves to understanding and promoting innovative thinking on collective governance. Our first guest, Audrey Tang, was part of the Sunflower Student Movement in 2014 and then entered politics, becoming the second youngest person to ever be appointed to the Taiwanese cabinet in 2015. And she's now the digital minister of Taiwan. Audrey has sought to make the internet a place for civic participation, a place to create a transparent government through open data and and radical transparency with all of Audrey's meetings recorded and uploaded online. With other democracies struggling with misinformation all over the world, Audrey is perhaps the global leader in how to use digital spaces to strengthen democracies. Our second guest, Joe Gouldy, is a historian of capitalism who is currently an associate professor at Southern Methodist University. Joe also directs Democracy Lab, an initiative across several universities to find ways to empower people to use technology to advance the public good. Joe writes frequently on land politics and is the author of two books, and her next book, The Long Land War, will be published next year in March. Audrey and Joe, to start, could you tell me about your respective backgrounds and how they've informed your interest in the importance for citizens to be active participants in their democracy? Audrey, welcome. Let's start with you. Yes, gladly. Taiwan was notified of the pandemic thanks to a young doctor, Li Wenliang, from Wuhan, who posted on their social media that there were seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market at the December of 2019. Now, in December 31st, the PTT, Taiwan's Digital Civic Infrastructure, gets this uh, notification by another young doctor, uh, Noma Pipe, and PTT immediately start to apply their collective and connective intelligence to triage this news. Just in 24 hours, we started health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan to Taiwan. So Dr. Li Wenliang literally saved the Taiwanese people, uh, while his message, of course, could not be transmitted to the people in Wuhan because of the very different infrastructure when it comes to internet-enabled listening. And PTT, because it has no shareholders nor advertisers for more than 25 years, is squarely in the social sector operating within the Taiwan academic network with a norm of what I call pro-social media rather than the more anti-social corners of social media. So that was the first, I guess, digital innovation that saved the people in Taiwan when it comes to the pandemic. Of course, mask rationing, contact tracing, and so on were co-created with G0V or Gov 
zero um, community, around 10,000 people on the same Slack chat channel uh, or Telegram or IRC uh, all the time uh, contributed to the internationally recognized early response. And this may, of course, also on the SMS-based contact tracing system where people can check in the public venues without having to download any app uh, and sending a SMS to a well-trusted uh, number 1922 representing the counter-epidemic uh, command center uh, without uh, having to pay SMS charge and no worries about the privacy implications as well because it's just stored in the five telecom carriers. If there's no contact tracing request from a local contact tracing office, it's just deleted uh, after 28 days. So, so far there's a quarter billion SMS sent this way and around 11 million that has been used to shorten the contact tracing from more than 24 hours per confirmed case to less than 24 minutes. And that's why, of course, for the past couple of months, there's essentially zero local cases in Taiwan and we're back to safety. And Joe, we'll move to you. So there's also a story, a longer story about uh, the out outbreak of SARS. Why is it that Taiwan was able to develop this culture of trust in government? In the United States, we had various decentralized initiatives to try to make up some kind of contact tracing. It was happening on a state-by-state -state basis. My own university had its own contact tracing app, but there was no centralized initiative. And indeed, many, many intelligent people felt that if the federal government were to release a contact tracing app, it wouldn't be accepted in the United States in the way that the, the people of Taiwan had come to accept these apps. So when I, I've spoken about this with my colleagues in China history and the history of Taiwan, and what they've explained to me is that 20 years ago, when the first outbreaks of SARS occurred, Taiwan had already gone through some initial experiences with sharing privacy and the kinds of issues that come up in a society in which people trust the government to monitor where they are every moment of the day. So for example, there were news stories 20 years ago about individuals who were having an affair and that information came to public light because they were exposed as having the disease when they were away from their home at a time when they shouldn't, when their family thought they shouldn't have been away from their home. The media had had a conversation about this. The people of Taiwan had had a conversation about privacy and the kinds of risks and intrusions that monitoring data by the government might cause. And one of the things that the Taiwanese government had done, even in the years leading up to the Sunflower Revolution, was to openly vet and answer and speak to these concerns. So there was a dialogue set up between public health experts and journalists in the media, and ordinary members of the public. The Sunflower Movement, of course, played on that and expanded that. Government ministers made themselves more responsive, answered questions online, shared all of the documentation about their conversations with lobbyists. The Sunflower Movement was able to build on a culture of public trust in government. And my understanding is that that's one of the reasons why the, why the contact tracing was successful in Taiwan. The government had worked to educate the public. A question that, that, that arises from this, we, I think we sometimes stumble in thinking through the role of government and information in the United States because of the history of propaganda. Propaganda is the word for government dissemination of information in a top-down fashion, where the government is printing posters saying, loose lips sink ships. Our experience with propaganda in the, in the United States dates from the Second World War. And we've largely stepped away from the propaganda model. Propaganda is associated with dictatorships. It's associated with fascism. So I'd like to ask, Audrey, to help us to understand, I think I could use help understanding and many American listeners could also use help understanding, what is the difference between the culture of trust in government that allows this open sharing of data, that allows listening? How is that different in Taiwan from propaganda? My favorite quote from the Dao De Jing uh, was, to give no trust is to get no trust. By trusting the citizens, that is the entire different world, as opposed to if the government has developed one single application, it's not the case in Taiwan. 
The SMS contact tracing system is not government invention or government technology. As I mentioned, it's part of the GovZero community's co-creation. And the people who participated in the co-creation are the people, for example, who operate the PTT, the people who uh, are in charge of some previous contact tracing systems in other parts of the world, the people who are in charge of one of the most popular messaging tools in Taiwan, and so on. So a broad collective intelligence that connects through the network of contact tracing developers around the world uh, mapped out the possible solution space and converged on SMS that's not transmitted to government really, but rather stayed uh, in the telecom operators, emerged as the specification. And my role is simply, I call it reverse procurement, right, to deliver on the civil society expectations of a safe and privacy-preserving contact tracing system. So by trusting the citizens and not delegate, but rather working with the people and have the social sector set the norm, the public sector simply amplify these norms and we implement it in a way that's entirely voluntary if you want to use pen and paper or any other method uh, in addition to or replacing the SMS-based contact tracing system, you're still free to do that. There is no penalty for not using this newly invented system, which is why it doesn't uh, foreclose future possibilities of iteration. And it amplifies the norm such that the private sectors uh, adhere to the norm, not because it's a government mandate, but because the citizens already prototype and ask for it. So I call this forking the government, taking government digital services, developing a different direction by the people closest to the pain and suffering. And our job, again, is just to amplify them. I'm also really interested to know, uh, Audrey, how were civil liberties, which are so important in Taiwan, maintained during the tracking and tracing of COVID? Yes, that's a really great question. So uh, we use a principle, and by we, uh, I mean the GovZero community who designed this thing, uh, use a idea called secure multi-party computation. It is one of the privacy-enhancing technologies that ensures, for example, the telecoms, which has your check-in SMS records, nevertheless has no access to the mapping table between the digits that represents the venue and the actual venue themselves to individual telecom operators is just random code that means nothing. And for the QR code maker, anyone can be a QR code maker, by the way, but for the primary QR code maker at TradeFan, they do not have any access uh, to your SMS records or indeed of any person entering the venue. They just interact with the venue owners to make some unique 15 digits code. Unless you are a contact tracer that has the lawful authorization to get the puzzle pieces from the Taipei Pass system, from the five telecoms, from TradeFan, and so on. Uh, individually, those data do not compromise anyone's privacy because it's just like puzzle piece. Without piecing together, it does not complete a contact tracing. So what I'm trying to get at is that if we design with privacy and accountability in mind in the very beginning, then it leads naturally, for example, to people who want to see which contact tracer in which municipality have accessed their records in the past 28 days. And they can simply visit SMS.1922, the GOV.TW, enter in their phone number, respond to an SMS, and then uh, just see the entire reverse accountability audit record. And so all of these are earning trustworthiness, as Joe mentioned, by essentially giving an account whenever there is a doubt, instead of uh, blanketly saying, oh, the state knows the best. Actually, the state just designed the process and mechanism, but do not hoard the data in any centralized way. I think this is really interesting, Audrey. You're talking about creating a ledger or an archive of privacy, an archive of access. So every time, every time the QR code tracker looks at an individual and where they've been, there's that information is recorded so that citizens can keep monitoring the state even while the state monitors citizens. It's a two-way transaction and the ledger is there, the archive is there so that even after the moment you can, you can ask, how was the state accessing my data? How, who was doing so? 
I think this is a really important point because when we talk about open government and open information in the United States, much of the discussion in the mainstream media is dominated by conversations about Bitcoin, which is just one, one section of ledger, only financial transactions. Can you say a little bit more about the kinds of archives and ledgers that you've used and why designing them appropriately is so important? Distributed ledger technologies form an important inspiration uh, to the Taiwanese civic technologies community. Indeed, many of the developers in, for example, the Ethereum ecosystem and Tezos and many other ecosystems uh, are either primarily or uh, importantly based in Taiwan. So when we introduced, for example, the mask rationing system last February, people immediately thought, yeah, this is something a ledger technology could help. And with the help again from GovZero uh, last February, all the pharmacies in Taiwan, more than 6,000 of them, publish their real-time inventory of medical grade masks. Every 30 seconds, there is a kind of global update to more than 100 different applications. Some are interactive maps, some are chatbots, voice assistants, things like that, to ensure that whenever anyone purchases two or three masks at a local pharmacy using their national health uh, insurance IC card. More than 100 different developers uh, get this renewed number immediately so that people queuing after them uh, actually can check their phone and see in real time uh, whether this pharmacy is going to run out of masks, whether they should queue elsewhere. They can make that decision even beco- uh, before uh, deciding uh, which pharmacy they want to, to use. So again, this is a kind of coordinated solution, uh, but it's not implemented in a centralized way. Rather, uh, all the different interactive visualizations points out, for example, to the data bias uh, that privileges uh, the uh, urban areas because uh, initially we're distributing based on physical distance, but not everyone owns a helicopter, as the OpenStreetMap community pointed out to us uh, rather quickly. And then uh, they forked the government essentially by interpolating uh, through an MP to our Minister of Health and Welfare. They said, um, I think we have this better distribution method based on the real-time number that you publish. So demonstration is not a protest here. Demonstration is literally a demo. And Mr. Chen said, yeah, legislator teach us. And the very next day, we started implementing a better distribution mechanism. So this is not a accountability in the traditional sense of the government does everything. <laughs> Rather, this is truly co-creation where the citizens can also contribute better algorithm to address data bias. I love the story, Audrey, that you talk about how you went to your colleagues and you said it's the people who actually have a better plan with how to manage the masks. Different places were going to run out of masks and you said that we have to um, kind of work with the people and engage with their ideas. You've mentioned a little bit about the GovZero movement. Could you describe, Audrey, a little bit about how citizens in Taiwan improve the user experience of government platforms using the GovZero website. For the past 10 years or so, um, GovZero has been systematically looking at the digital services in Taiwan, which is usually something that GOV, the TW, and forking those services into something that G0 v the TW. For example, in our national participation platform, join the GOV the TW. If you change your O to a zero, join the G0 v the TW, then you get into the Gov0 Slack channel. So basically, uh, what Gov0 is doing is showing alternate imaginations of what's possible in government digital services, but always in open source and creative common licenses so that it's a soft fork, as we say in the DLT space. If the state wins in popularity uh, and the Gov0 uh, alternatives gain in popularity, then the state can at any given time, and we did so for many different occasions, simply say, oh, we can't beat them, so we join them and simply adapt the Gov0 designs uh, through reverse procurement in, um, instead of traditional procurement uh, and integrate it into the government services. I'd like to move into the history of civic technology in Taiwan and its parallel taxation system. Taiwan's civic tech East Crew system seems to be significantly rooted into the fabric of 
Taiwanese society, which is perhaps the product of the 10 year transition period between martial law ending in 1987 and the first democratic elections in 1996. I'm really interested to know whether Taiwan's civic technology during the pandemic can be attributed to the fact that during martial law, the state somewhat failed to provide services to its citizens. So basic government services were faltering and community service organizations, CSROs, started delivering them to the population, bringing about really a decentralization of services and a parallel taxation system where people donated to these platforms, these CSOs, in order to support them, which still remains to this day. So a question for both yourself, Joe and Audrey, how do these civic institutions, not only in Taiwan, but also elsewhere, strengthen the social fabric of a society? And what are the benefits for a parallel taxation system? When I was a child in the late 80s, Taiwan already had a very strong social sector. Uh, the cooperatives movement, the social entrepreneurs, the local charities, and so on, indeed delivered many essential services and campaigned for democratization even before the martial law was lifted. I think one uh, large event around the turn of century was the um, September 21st earthquake. And the uh, earthquake really caught people of different parts of the social sector, uh, of different faiths, of different practitions, uh, to essentially work together out of necessity and build social solidarity. Because the disaster is such a massive scale that people simply cannot um, rely on the local and central government to provide the necessary response in time. And afterwards, uh, for pretty much all the large disasters, and I include the Occupy of the Parliament, the Sunflower Movement in that, the social sector that already had a prior experience of trusting each other uh, simply bonded together. So the Occupy Movement was really orchestrated in 2014 by more than 20 NGOs, uh, which um, has the corners on the occupied parliament on the street and actually people half a million people on the street worked toward getting the messages of the 20 ngos across each other so that the cross-strait service and trade agreement is debated not from a purely economic perspective but also from the system risk uh, associated to cybersecurity, to labor conditions, to LGBTIQ rights, and many other things, giving a more full-fledged deliberation on the quality of the uh, occupied parliament and its um, constituents of people who participate in the movement. So I uh, do agree that this is continuous. Fascinating. And Jared? This is so interesting. I think about the history of the CSOs in Taiwan that you've been telling us about, Audrey. You know, it occurs, I'm asking myself why it seems that America has had such a different experience of civic technology over the last 10 years. 10 years ago, it seemed to many Americans as if technology itself was a silver arrow. Add technology and add the internet and you will instantly get a democratic revolution. And on the basis of this kind of thinking, many Americans believed that, for instance, that an Arab Spring would be possible with democratic revolutions across the Middle East. And this, of course, did not happen. And technology provided certain freedoms and revolutions in Taiwan. But in America, looking backwards over the last 10 years, we mostly see a story of fake news and political division and the creation of echo chambers. So rather than technology providing the opportunity for people to come together and build collaboratively in the way that you're talking about in Taiwan, we've seen divisiveness. Now, if I try to understand this as a facet of American history, I'm lost. The American history has a great history of collaboration. And there was a cooperative movement here. There were back to the land movements here, just as there was a cooperative movement in Taiwan. There have been strong civil society and voluntary organizations in the United States. And we had our own Occupy movement where people showed up with food and they cre spontaneously created book tents and library tents and a religion tent. People turned out in the street and offered their time, their money, their resources, caring for each other, street medics appeared on the, on the cities of North America. 
So we are also a, a collaborative culture. It seems to me possible that we're beginning to understand, historians of America are beginning to understand that one of the things that's happened over the last 40 years is a growing distrust of government in the United States, which has been in many ways planted. For example, in many of the textbooks, which have been assigned at the uh, secondary level, textbooks published by evangelical history publishing houses, which, for example, have made a case that the Civil War wasn't fought over slavery, that America was inherently designed as a nation for capitalism, a Christian nation, rather than a nation designed around Enlightenment principles. And maybe through reading these textbooks, we have persuaded ourselves and each other that we are a nation that cannot cooperate You've spoken so beautifully about the experience of your own experience uh, coming up in the cooperative movement, learning to trust and work with others, but also the way in which Taiwan and Taiwanese schooling is providing an education in cooperation. For example, I, I, I think I heard the figure that now there is an opportunity to propose government initiatives and some quarter of these new government initiatives come out of the secondary schools where students are doing capstone projects. Could you speak to me in general about the role of education and how it is that a society learns to collaborate with each other? What is the experience in Taiwan like? In Taiwan, indeed, uh, we have a constitution that mandates fostering from the state of the cooperative movement. It's part of the constitution. And when I was a child, each and every primary school and middle school uh, has to have a consumer co-op within that school, democratically elected, to make sure that uh, we eat healthy food during lunch breaks and things like that. So uh, these are small things, but I do think that it gives rise to a culture where people instinctively think of cooperative solutions to structural social issues instead of relying on the uh, capitalistic solutions that relied mostly on the control of a few shareholders that uh, uh, people has no democratic governance over. Right? So the early experiences are important. And in the, this century, of course, we focus on the education reform uh, that replaced the literacy to competence. Literacy, again, is when you're just a receiver of media, of radio and television, for example. But competence is when we're makers and remixers and producers of our own narrative. One case in point is that in a lot of the schools, I think it's most schools now, the climate science and data science are taught via airboxes, which is this device that measures PM2.5 and other climate indicators and contributes to a distributed ledger uh, maintained by our National Academy and supported by our National Center for High-Speed Computation, decidedly uh, distributed so that uh, the students learn if they maintain the airbox well, actually their friends, their neighbors, their family, before deciding whether they want to go out for a job or something, uh, will rely on the data that they could curate and produce. And if they want more precision around their community, they can very easily get one It's open hardware and place it on their balcony or things like that. And again, this is beautiful data collaboratives uh, that the students uh, with Without being indoctrinated with any top-down ideas about how data should work, they see for their uh, first-hand educational classes and capstone projects how to tune, how to work with the other uh, data that's contributed by other data altruists. Uh, and if there's, as I said, data bias, data stewardship problems, and so on, it's uh, within their rights and within their duty uh, to fix that uh, in their school. And I think it's very powerful when we concentrate on the competence rather than literacy. I think that's so fascinating, Audrey. And Joe, with what you brought up, Taiwan is such a, a cooperative nation, and we've talked about early experiences co for cooperation. What I'm really interested in, what this makes me really curious about is incentives for the Taiwanese people to cooperate and to develop civic tech, which I think is really the key to understanding how it can be applied elsewhere. Audrey, what would you say is the incentive for Taiwanese people to cooperate at such a high level and to create these civic organizations and civic tech for common good? 
But as I said, the social sector, when fully empowered, is in charge of creating the norms and habits, and that again has higher legitimacy because of our history, as compared to the rules and regulations produced by the state by the public sector. Instead of a relatively disempowering stance, where each person only contributes three bits of information every four years to governance, called voting, by the way, this is a higher bandwidth,、uh, direct participation and direct action、uh, that can result in better changes faster. So almost like instant gratification, and that of course is a very strong intrinsic, of course,、uh, incentive, but also extrinsic because by、um, you know. Tackling the pandemic with no lockdowns, it allowed our economy to thrive. So obviously, there's also economic incentive at play here. Angela, I think you had a question, so I'll let you jump in. I love that Audrey talks about democracy as an information problem that's solved by more bits of information. And it occurs to me that in in America, in Europe, in most of the world, we embrace something like this. You know, we want to grow up and become one of the people who contributes to a world of shared information. So I do that as a researcher, and my medic friends do that when they write articles. My scientist friends do it. We send it off to peer review. It becomes part of the academic. Research matrix of the articles that all of us have access to through our academic subscriptions, but there's a paywall around all of that information. We share with this information commons and with each other. That's something that experts get to do, whether they're working for NOAA or Parks and Wildlife or social services, or they're a doctor working for a major hospital.、Uh, they're sharing with other experts. But ordinary people have to pay fifty to two hundred dollars to access just one of these research papers. We also have、uh, now a growing culture of kids learning to do things, kids learning to get their hands dirty. This is called the maker culture. So, in my child's school and in many schools around America, there's there's great enthusiasm for teaching children to code, teaching them Arduinos. But it's very very rare. To see those practices connected to a public ledger, again with the exception of Bitcoin, which we love, but the idea of having a citywide program for collecting air quality measures, as you've done in Taiwan, or a citywide collection of information about homelessness—that's something that experts do, that ordinary people aren't allowed to participate in. And I think this.、Uh, I think what you're helping us to understand, Audrey, is the the kind of transformation of the soul, as well as of the community more generally, that happens when we establish the fact that we're working on a common project. That a common project is worth holding in the attention of many hands. Pets 隐私强化科技
。这些新技术的发展，强化了个人资料使用上的安全。科学家在进行大数据研究时，看不到或不用碰触原始资料本身，就可以降低隐私泄露的风险。以同态加密为例，将加密后资料上传云端，让科学家对着密文做操作，有了国家级超级电脑算力的支持，让因为加密而膨胀数倍的密文运算得以被发展及应用。当然，还有更多新的加密技术发展中。强大的计算力提供了验证模拟的环境，想象未来适应后量子时代的新加密自然科技，借由国家数位基础建设 p a t s 的新技术将更能分享扩散，为科技发展创造更充分的信任感。在医疗应用上，我们可以将健康资料加密后给科学家，进行分析研究，找出致病基因。在保障个人隐私前提下。发展更多个人化的医疗，更可以延伸到生活各层面。透过技术重建互信，让大数据的力量更能回馈大众乃至个人，创造一个以人为本、温暖的智慧国家。To give no trust is to get no trust. 透过技术重建互信，国家高速网络与计算中心和您共同向前迈进。You did mention about how, at primary schools and high schools, children in Taiwan, most of them do learn to code. And I'm interested to know, Taiwanese democracy and the internet really emerged at the same time and developed together. And you've spoken about how citizens have an intuitive understanding of the liberating power of information technology. Can you talk a little bit about that topic? So, for example. In Taiwan, we use、uh, still paper-based ballot when we vote for people, electronic. Sometimes when we vote for things, priorities and budgets.、Uh, but for people、uh, ballots, the counting mechanism is very well live streamed and recorded、um, from the very beginning to ensure the integrity of the voting process. The role of the observer, of course, is highlighted. But because, as I mentioned,、uh, the wide web is already around when we vote the president for the first time directly, the counting booth became kind of small、um, YouTuber、uh, recording booth nowadays.、Uh, each major party has their own tallying app, and you see people just with their smartphones and so on. Well, it used to be larger cameras, but the same idea to to film the counting process. And and it has the、um, benefits of people participating not as party representatives but just、uh, a lay person, but they can contribute to resolve、uh, any election issues.、Uh, and when the counting、um, app of one major party agrees with the opposition major party,、uh, there is simply no dispute and no room for the trolls to grow when it comes to the disagreeing counts. Any election counting station, and when you scale it. To a nationwide level, it leads to a faster resolution in post-election disputes, which of course doesn't happen in advanced democracies like、uh, the U.S.、Uh, but in Taiwan, it used to be a, a problem, and people develop digital democratic tools not to replace the paper-based voting, but actually augment that voting with、uh, even more trustworthy counting、uh, live streaming process. And、uh, leading before the presidential election, there is the presidential debate and forums by the three candidates. Days. And again, the middle schoolers, as well as really anyone, can contribute to the meta competence by typing in what they heard and cross-check it、uh, with a wealth of databases that is already collected by the professional journalists and help in the fact-checking work. But this is not just assigned homework. If they revealed that the presidential candidate says something that's factually inaccurate, their facts appear on national public TV in real time. So they contribute to the democratic process both right before and right after the national election. I'd like to turn now to the philosophical foundations of Taiwan's political system and how that shapes democracy in Taiwan. Audrey, you've said in the past that the ideas of the 19th century economist Henry George permeate through Taiwan's policies. 
I'm really interested in hearing about how his ideas on land rights and ownership have influenced the collective mindset of Taiwan. Joe, I'd love for you to frame for us who Henry George was and the idea of land value increment tax. And we can then have Audrey delve into his impact on Taiwan. One of the interesting facts of Taiwan's history is that Taiwan and America share some episodes, some important episodes in the history of governance. Taiwan famously had a land reform, a redistribution of the land from a handful of wealthy aristocrats to everyone in Taiwan during American occupation. And this land reform was in a certain way modeled after the two major American land reforms, the Homestead Act in the 19th century and the GI Bill immediately after the Second World War, both of which established a precedent for widespread land ownership through government intervention. The GI Bill is responsible for the fact that in most American cities, there are sprawling American suburbs where middle-class families, at least middle-class white families, could expect to own a, own a piece of land, paying it off on a government-backed mortgage. Both of these ideas of land redistribution can be traced to the movement of the late 19th century, to ideas about what unrestrained capitalism did to rent. In a system of unrestrained capitalism, the rent goes higher and higher. There's no no bar stopping trees from growing to heaven. And so you have to introduce measures of for widespread land ownership or rent control to keep rent within a, the reasonable cost of something that ordinary people can afford. So those ideas in the 1880s were associated with the San Francisco journalist, Henry George, who saw the transformation of San Francisco from uh, a recently settled town in the West where many people could afford a place to live to the, to the estates of railway barons subsidized by their earnings, plowing railways across the the. the the west of the United States, railways that were subsidized by the federal government. So we're talking about a, a moment in time, a gilded age, not unlike our own, where the fabulously wealthy became even richer than before and where housing went out of the grasp of ordinary people. It's a familiar story to many Americans today, especially since the crisis of 2008 to 2010, mortgage and eviction crisis. So Taiwan has a special relationship to all of those stories, in part because Henry and George's ideas spread across the Pacific uh, through political actors like Sun Yat-sen, and then afterwards through the American occupations after the Second World War and the American-led redistributions of land in Korea, Taiwan, and Japan. But I, Audrey has spoken in some other venues about the importance of Sun Yat-sen to Taiwanese citizens over the age of 30, foundational idea that the state should keep a ledger of prices, convey information about real estate, real information about prices to citizens so that they can make informed decisions about the economy. If you like, I like to think about Henry George as a thinker about data and the life of information in economic opportunity well before the internet. He was thinking about land as a commons, the role of the state as making sure that information was accessible to all, using taxes to ensure that a wellspring of opportunity was available to all and that inequality had certain limits. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, and Audrey, if you want to delve into Henry George's impact on Taiwan. Well, one impact, um, of course, is that um, I pay also a small amount of land tax uh, each year. And if I think that I shouldn't pay this amount, which is calculated roughly by the real prices that is um, forcibly declared uh, on our transactions uh, around my neighborhood, right? Uh, if I think that for some reason uh, that the land tax that I should pay is much smaller than the amount that's calculated by the peer-to-peer -peer information. Well, I, I can say, you know, my, my land was nothing, so I shouldn't pay the tax. Uh, but the result of me saying that is the municipal government can then uh, just acquire uh, that piece of land at the cost of nothing, uh, because after all, I publicly said that, right? So, so this is the idea of the uh, Herberger's tax. 
uh, that gets more accurate bits of information of the self-gorged land price, even without uh, the calibration of the real price that's uh, the result of real estate uh, transactions around the vicinity in my neighborhood. Uh, still, it incentivizes me to actually pay the land tax, uh, but also report a more accurate number if those calculations are somehow biased. Uh, and so that is one direct uh, result, actually, is a Georgism. Uh, it's uh, one of the ideas that Henry George um, that held and influenced Sun Yat-sen, which became part of Taiwan's land tax system. I think it's so interesting how Taiwan is such a mishmash of dichotomies, of free market capitalism, but also this collectivist mindset with this really unique synthesis between Eastern and Western values. Recently, the president of Taiwan wrote an article for Foreign Affairs in which she describes Taiwan as vibrantly democratic and Western, yet influenced by a Chinese civilization and shaped by Asian traditions. How did the two of you see this synthesis of Eastern and Western values at play in Taiwan? And what do you think other countries around the world could learn from it? Well, I could briefly make the case that Taiwan is one of the most successful post-colonial nations. Taiwan deserves to be recognized as, as a symbol of hope in democracy, not only because of, of, of the work that Audrey and her ministry have accomplished in terms of creating an open and participatory government and experimenting with new technologies in a way that most governments in Europe and North America are still trying to learn. Uh, but also, if we think about the rise of China over the last 40 years, we think about, uh, the, about, about the strangulation of civil liberties in current day Hong Kong. Taiwan and India together have carved their own way, their own peaceful path to democracy and capitalism in alliance with the United States. We have to think about an island nation which has drawn on ancient traditions of many places, but also experimented with a kind of democracy and capitalism that's uniquely its own. And this is one of the reasons why I think so many people in the tech world and in the activism world and looking for working models of government reform are taking note of what Taiwan is doing right now. Yeah, to, to continue uh, the, the metaphor of Eastern and Western influences, uh, I think Taiwan as an island uh, is defined, of course, by the clash uh, between the Philippine Sea Plate on the east side and the Eurasian Plate on the west side. And when the two tectonic plates bump to each other, we have really large earthquakes uh, that, of course, cause for social solidarity and resilience in our buildings, but also the resilience in in our minds. Uh, so the people who uh, built such resilient, uh, as I call it, transcultural uh, frameworks can absorb uh, the energy that's released by the earthquake. And just like the top of Taiwan, the Savia, Pendogunong, the Yushan mountain that grows uh, two or three centimeters each year as a direct result of that clash. So, for example, when we legalized marriage equality, we take the definitely pretty Western uh, idea of marriage by registration and uh, rights and liberties that should be enjoyed regardless of one's gender and sexual orientation. But we also respected and honored uh, the tradition of the kinships uh, that is formed by the familial bounds and so on. So we legalized it using a, a nickname hyperlink act that says only the bylaws are wed when two same-sex persons wed, but their families, their kinships, their last name and so on do not wed. Uh, and this social innovation is a direct result of a constitutional court uh, ruling as well as two direct democracy referenda that passed and it defined such a solution space that uh, I call it a good enough consensus or rough consensus where everyone can live with. And then this model, uh, quite innovative, is then being considered seriously uh, by other uh, still, you know, kinship oriented societies around us in the Indo-Pacific as a kind of model that will enable the civil liberties and equalities without writing off uh, the cultures. And this is just one of the more recent examples of a transcultural uh, Republic of Citizens. 
Audrey, I'd love to talk about your Taoist approach to political life. You've mentioned in previous interviews the idea of do without doing, which in some ways to me harks back to your collectivist mindset and the collectivist mindset of Taiwan. For example, creating a space for others to collaborate can be seen as a Taoist approach. Could you comment on how you've used this belief system in your work? As I say quite publicly, that I work with the people, not for the people, work with the government, not for the government. These connective spaces are designed to make sure that each person participates, not as a representative, but just representing their authentic experience and innovations. And this applies also to the public service itself. The engagement officers that Joe briefly mentioned is one case in example where we put uh, professionals in the public service well outside of their silos as champions of citizen interest. So, for example, when we redesigned the tax filing system in 2017 out of a popular petition that says the tax filing was, and I quote, explosively hostile, end of quote, uh, to non-Windows users, um, the uh, breakout groups is chaired not by the people from the Ministry of Finance, but rather they could be from the Coastal Guard, uh, the Ocean Affairs Council. But when we talk about the ocean policy, how to enable more support for amateur surfers, amateur fishers, and so on, well, then maybe that breakout groups is facilitated by the Ministry of Finance Public Service. And the idea is very simple, because the uh, Coastal Guards person also have to file their own tax. Uh, and the tax collector uh, is also, of course, an avid surfer in their spare time. So when they facilitate such deliberative town halls and meetings, they automatically take the side of the citizen because after all, they are as citizens themselves as um, opposed to representatives within their professional silos. And these are just some of the designs of the participatory uh, officer network that deliberately put deliberation at the core of the public servant's work instead of being you know, a top-down mended way where they have to service the public. So in a sense, it's also an incentive to serve their own self-interest and their community, be it surfer or fisher's interest, uh, while of course offering their professional training as a public servant so that the translation occurs more easily between the professional community, the academic community, and the laypersons. In the US, we have this expectation that government provides the services. And of course, elsewhere, there's that expectation as well. We pay taxes, we hope to get high quality services in return for these taxes. And the legitimacy of the state rests on the provision of these services. But this doesn't really empower the citizenry to create their own civic spaces. And I'd love to know what other countries like the US could perhaps learn from Taiwan and perhaps adopt some of these Taiwanese practices? You know, I think it's important to remember that there was a time in American history and indeed in the history of the West when we didn't expect states to provide the services that we now expect. If you think back to the United States around 1820 or Great Britain and France around 1820, you're thinking about a time when cities don't have shared water systems. They don't have flush toilets. They don't have common sewers. When cholera breaks out across European and American cities in the 1830s and 40s, it will devastate populations both rich and poor because of our poor understanding of public health. Now, in those same decades, it's not normal to have sidewalks that anyone can walk on. You walk in the carriageway with all of the horses through all of the muck and mire. There aren't bridges that anyone can use. You have to pay a toll to cross a bridge. And if you want to get from one end of London to the next, then you might, might have to pay 20 toll bridges to get from here to there, which means that there are fewer opportunities for the poor cobbler to sell his wares at an ordinary market. In the West, we had to have a revolution in information to build modern city services. And that information was largely about trust. We invented modern professionals like the modern civil engineer. We invented modern, modern means of keeping accounts and inspecting budgets together and approving them. 
And we trusted our delegates to make those decisions. And it was new, and it was sometimes corrupt. And it changed the structure of capitalism from a force that primarily benefited a tiny minuscule majority, minority to a structure where a rising tide floats all boats. It was a fundamental transformation. It was one of the things that thinkers like Adam Smith thought was wonderful about capitalism, was that it could be extended in that way. And I think it's important to remember that that was made. It wasn't an accident that was inherent in capitalism. We could, we could, All we have to look, do is look at what cities were like in, in London or Paris in 1810 to imagine a very different kind of capitalism that worked only for the upper 1%, a world in which all of the land is owned by the aristocracy, where all of the markets work only for the enrichment of the few rather than the many. If we want to see a more equal world where there is more opportunity and capitalism works for more people, we may need in today's world to reconsider the question of infrastructure and data. And I think Taiwan is at the cutting edge of a modern experiment with information and data, with broadcast citizen participation, in which they have proved that you can solve a problem like COVID by increasing what Audrey has called the bit rate of information, where we up citizens on and store managers across Taiwan are sending in information every 30 seconds about where there are masks, where you can find them, where we allow contact tracing so long as we, the citizens, can see the guards, watch the people who are watching us. There's a give and take. We've had to imagine that, or rather Taiwan has had to imagine what that future is. But now that Taiwan has seen it and has imagined it, I think it's altogether appropriate for other nations to start taking note and start to imagine what similar kinds of infrastructure and data sharing technologies might look like. But if I may, I have a follow-up question from that. If we see Taiwan as in a way rounding the arc of history a little bit ahead of other nations, glimpse something, something about the information economy that allows ordinary people to become players, that it allows us to share common goods like air quality or public health in a more robust way. I wonder if Taiwan's experience with infrastructure and data can help us to understand how to fight climate change. And I mean that in a very direct way. I've just published an article about participatory governance, reviewing many activist experiments around the world. All around the world, there are indigenous people and working class groups and city movements that are collecting information on air quality and water quality and public health, collecting incidents of people who are contracting cancer after being exposed to toxic waste. They have that data, but it has nowhere been collected in a centralized register. In my article, I suggested that perhaps this is a fault of the lack of cooperative government. We have no international authority with binding agency over climate change. A Trump or a Bolsonaro can turn away from the climate agreements. And similarly, we have no centralized authority now to collect and monitor the data of climate change. All of these people who are getting sick, we have centralized Corporate, corporate technologies that are using satellite data to monitor admissions, and that may be useful for stopping certain kinds of pollution. But I wonder about Taiwan's experiments with grassroots data collection. And I wonder if Audrey has any insight for us about the role of participatory technology and infrastructure in helping us to fight climate change and pollution more generally? Definitely. Um, in Taiwan, we have this annual event called the Presidential Hackathon uh, that also takes place actually right here in the Social Innovation Lab, uh, where more than 200 projects from social innovators across Taiwan, uh, we use a new voting system called quadratic voting that invites people to reveal uh, the synergy between those projects. Uh, and with this new voting system, uh, we take the top 20 
coach them uh, across collaboration of different sectors until it uh, culminates in the five champion teams uh, each year, which receive this trophy from our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. The trophy is the shape of Taiwan, like this, uh, with a microprojector underneath. And if we turn on the microprojector, it projects Dr. Tsai Ing-wen giving you the trophy. So it's very meta, it describes itself. The trophy represents whatever you did in the past three months on a smaller scale for one river, for one neighborhood, will become public policy in the next fiscal year, as if it's a presidential promise. So basically, it's a way to offer national agenda setting power with all the personnel, budget, and regulatory changes required, and invest that to five teams each year. And we just got a result of the five championship teams, actually, very recently, uh, in the past couple of weeks. Um, and this time, uh, four out of the five uh, are working on climate change and climate action. The other was on long-term health care reform. So we now have the cases, for example, uh, where the last community, the original community that built those air boxes on the civic tech, now shifting their attention to water pollution and measurements through water boxes and many other uh, endeavors. We have another championship team um, evolving the previous championship case uh, where people show a mask map-like system of drinking fountains and refilling people's bottles and calculating the plastic and carbon reduction and apply that idea to cataloging the carbon sinks uh, and make sure that people uh, augment their realities by committing to support those carbon sinks uh, from community action. And so the Taiwan Electric Company also offered uh, a way to use the residual heat from their uh, plants uh, to aid in fish farming uh, and reduce carbon uh, because otherwise it will have to um, emit more heat uh, than required. So turning a side product uh, into something that could be circularly used and so on. Uh, and so I believe this is not a, a top-down thing, right? The centralized registry will necessarily come from the various way to account for the carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases uh, from the social sector. And then the championship teams provide uh, a way for us as part of the presidential hackathon committee uh, to look at already existing ways for people around the globe that's uh, making such accounts successfully on the local level, but then elevate the underlying principles to the presidential or countrywide level in the next fiscal year. Thank you so much for that, both of you. As a kind of final question, I'd love to get your opinion, Audrey, on what are the most important issues for us to focus on for the future in Taiwan and elsewhere? As I mentioned, uh, already many jurisdictions look at Taiwan, the Taiwan model, so to speak, of a successful people-public-private partnership. But I would like to focus the attention not just on the biological virus and its prevention uh, or carbon dioxide and some uh, you know, physical emissions, but rather the virus of the mind, right? The polarization, the divisiveness, the hate and discriminatory vengeful action that's taken by people in the more anti-social corners of social media, which may initially be good to manufacture counterpower but it's not good at all when we're talking about digital democracy. So the idea of a pro-social social media, of deliberative design on deliberative spaces, of the nationwide investment, for example, in 2016, when we classified PTT or joint platform and so on as public infrastructure on the digital realm and can allocate special budget money that's previously only allocated to the bridges and roads uh, that are concrete, like made out of concrete. Uh, those ideas, I think, are important around the world for us to reinvest in pro-social social media and the digital equivalents of the institution that we rely on the physical space, you know, university campuses, uh, the parks and national parks, the town halls and so on, so that the citizens around the world will not be forced to deliberate about public issues 
in the digital equivalent of a nightclub with very loud music and noise and addictive drinks and private bouncers. I have nothing to uh, to to. I have no grudge against the entertainment sector, uh, but the nightclub is simply not the place to hold a town hall. Thank you so much, Audrey and Joe, for joining me on this radical exchange talk. It's been such a pleasure to have both of you. And as every journalist is meant to ask at the end of an interview, any final comments from both of you? I've spoken too much. So. I would just second, Audrey's given us a vision of a renewed moment of building public infrastructure. And I love the parallel of setting up commons online that are the equivalent of the public parks. And again, I, I think it's so important that Americans and Europeans, we easily forget that so many of these college campuses and parks that we enjoy in our cities, they had to be built. They were built often in one generation of only to walk, to drive from one end of Chicago to another, to think about the era, the generation in which all of those parks were laid out and funded and all of those baseball diamond, diamonds laid down, all of those rec centers built. And there are a handful that were built later in the 1960s and 1970s and more recently. But it's often the work of one generation to build the kinds of spaces that uh, people will live in thereafter. And we do need safe spaces for discourse. We do need safe infrastructure for democracy and for managing climate and environmental data. In fact, that's probably the only way that our institutions of democracy or the health of our environment are going to survive in the coming generations if we build them so that we can use them. So thank you for giving us that vision of a livable future. I hope we can learn from it and live in it. Definitely. Um, and thank you for this awesome conversation. Uh, I look forward to meet you uh, in person. Uh, but before then, uh, live long and prosper. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thank you so much, Joe. The nation state is the usual way we think about democracy. We think of democracy happening in a particular geographic territory for a particular set of people who've historically lived there, often sharing a language and a history. Today, so many of the things that affect us stretch across nations or within them. So for example, the Amazon River stretches across about six countries and only covers a small part of most of those. It's incredibly important to the global ecosystem that allows us to avoid climate catastrophe. And yet it has this fragmented governance in the conflict between a bunch of countries, each of which is only partly focused on it. That is a entity that should have a democratic governance over it. There is no entity that really corresponds to the Amazon River. There's no entity that really corresponds to the people who are most affected by the drug war in the United States. There's no entity that really corresponds to the communities of interest, whether they be around a cryptocurrency, around transgender issues, around racial injustice. There are a bunch of national polities that exist for historical reasons, but that don't necessarily correspond to the way in which social life has evolved. What we need to find a way to do is to allow those communities to govern themselves and to gain the power to emerge as just as legitimate and just as meaningful as the geographical nation states. That doesn't mean geographical nation states should go away. In fact, I think they can benefit precisely from embracing these networks, but it does mean that they're not a sufficient foundation for governance today. This video has already started.
though it seems 2020 still lingers. The pandemic threw the world off balance, causing global change and uneasiness. Restrictions and isolation have become dreadful shackles. But we believe there is a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. Through innovative thinking and digital technology, we can cross boundaries and demonstrate the resilience of our people. Insight into the problems of everyday life. Together with the government's open data, we will find a direction for sustainable development. Facing challenges and opportunities of this new era, we will raise the sails for civic hackers to navigate on the sea of digital waves. 2021, Hackers Set Sail. Hello everyone and welcome to this Radical Exchange. Today I have with me Isabel Ho from GovZero, Ohyeon Guan from Code for Korea, and Hao Seki from Code for Japan. And we're going to be talking about civic tech and more specifically about the movements that drive them, creating the social infrastructure that is needed for great civic technology to emerge. Code for Korea and Code for Japan are branches of the largest civic tech network in the world, the Code for All network, which is centered on driving social change through digital technology, citizen participation, and collaborative decision-making, while improving the relationship between governments and citizens. This is a movement that I was also a part of, as a brigade captain in my hometown, in Brazil, where I'm from. And GovZero is based in Taiwan, and it's a polycentric community of self-organized contributors hoping to improve civil society through open source technology and open collaboration. So Isabel Hao and Ohion, thank you so much for agreeing to join this conversation. Around a month ago, I joined a meeting with some of you, which was called Facing the Ocean. And this is a space where you discuss different collaborations and joint projects between GovZero, Code for Korea, and Code for Japan. And in that meeting, when I first presented the idea of having a roundtable discussion with people from each of the three communities, there was this immediate resistance that some of you expressed, which was that nobody really wanted to stand here as a kind of representative. So I want to start this conversation with a caveat that none of you can speak for the movements that you're a part of because these are open and very much diverse groups. And I want to talk more about this today because these values are really super central to how you operate. But before I do that, and having stated this caveat, I want to ask each of you to share a little bit about your background and how you have come to be a part of these movements. And I also want to know what is your favorite example of a civic technology? Isabel, if you can get us started. Thanks for having me here. Um, I'm Isabel from Gabdiro, Taiwan, and I participate in the uh, Gabdiro community um, uh, in 2012, uh, when I have to uh, find some places, some spaces for the first hackathon uh, for the GovZero community. So um, that's because I'm uh, old friends uh, with uh, founders of the GovZero community since 2000. Uh, I met them as a, um, I'm asked by the open source community in Taiwan to explain and read the uh, open source licenses uh, for community members at, at that time. So that's why I started to mingle with this uh, open source guy since then. And um, I'm very, very happy that we have this uh, hack zone in 2012 and uh, it um, hosted uh, by monthly until now after nine, almost 10 years. And we have we will have another uh, 47 uh, hack zone ne uh, next month. So um, 
that's for me for now. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. And what's your favorite example of a civic technology? There are a lot of um, uh, projects I loved in the community. One of my favorites, maybe the, the first one, uh, the visualization of a government budget, uh, because it's the uh, first project in um, in the Gov Zero community, and we can say it's a starting point of everything. And it is uh, reused and uh, deployed uh, in many different uh, countries and uh, in cities and in because it's for the central government budget at first, but it is used in um, city level um, and even the village level um, budget afterwards. So I, I think this is a very good examples for what we want to do and what we are trying to do. Um, we are trying to build open source tools that can help, that can be used uh, by many different people. So uh, people do not have to make the uh, wheels again by themselves. They can build up something uh, on the basis of what we have, have made. Yes. That's incredible. Can you share a little bit more about uh, what is the budget visualization project? And also how, how it was uh, constructed, which is also a very interesting story. The project is, uh, the owner of the project is uh, uh, Jia Liang Gao and uh, Kirby, who are uh, co-founders of the Gov Zero community. And they bring up this project into Yahoo Hacking Day, which, which is a, a hack song held by yahoo.com in Taiwan. And they use the data of the central government bu uh, budget. Uh, then they just use the, the numbers uh, data and the visualize those data into different circles, a uh, big and a small bubble. Then you can see the bigger the bubble is, which means uh, the, the bigger the budget is. So you can just uh, very easy to recognize which is uh, um, the most important or big sh biggest share of the uh, government budget um, because no one will check out the numbers in the budget book you know but if it, it is shown in this way in these uh, simple uh, pictures then uh, even for very uh, young people like my children they can recognize uh, how, how and um, uh, the gov government spend our taxes, you know. So um, yeah, that's what it runs then. And they share the code in Go uh, GitHub. And even, af it, even after nine years, we got a message from someone uh, in Brazil. And uh, the engineer said that they use, he used the code, code to visualize the, their village uh, budget in Brazil, For which the city is very, of Sao Paulo. yeah. 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 Uh, uh, not in Sao Paulo. I think it's smaller. Oh, city. Maybe there's another yeah. one. Uh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, so it's very encouraging. So, yeah. So uh, that, that's why I love the, the project a lot. It's a simple, but it's reused. Uh, yes. Yes, it's an amazing one. Um, so how are Ohion, if you uh, would like to go ahead and uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves and um, what is your favorite example of a civic tech? Yeah, thank you for inviting us. And uh, let me introduce myself first. And uh, I started my career uh, as a, a video and community platform developer and uh, product manager at a platform company uh, in Korea. Uh, I have been built citizen participation platforms like debating, blogging, uh, petition, and citizen journalism. Uh, and after that, I founded a, a party cooperative, uh, which is making uh, several uh, digital democracy platforms and methodologies as a uh, digital democracy activist. So I'm making a platforms and social organizations uh, which empowering citizens and help citizens to make an impact is always my uh, job and role. And so, and we met uh, GovZero friends at Open Government Partnership in Korea three years ago. And we talked about events 
to sharing Ibex experience and knowledge more deeply in East Asia civic hacking groups. And, East, and, and as you know, East Asia has lots of difficult uh, geopolitical issues we are sharing. <laughs> so here are citizens, but here and citizens have been done a very crucial role to make a society better. So I thought um, it's very interesting and useful to build a civic hacking network in East Asia, which support each other's role in each country and collaborate together to deal with common issues in, in our area. So I think it has been so fun to me <laughs> and uh, we did a lot of influence uh, to each other country, I think. And in Korea, uh, there has not uh, been a national civic hacking community uh, yet, so, but we started to create a national wide civic hacking community while doing various projects in the corona, corona COVID-19 situation. And so Code for Korea started uh, again last year. <laughs> and uh, I, it's my favorite uh, project to related to COVID-19. I remember uh, the COVID-19 data disclosure request in, and making an app uh, we made last year. And it was very miracle moment in Korea uh, to all of us, like uh, civic hackers, platform companies, and government officials, and mostly citizens. So uh, nowadays, yeah, the government has now uh, created on some uh, methodologies where if there there is a problem, uh, they will they open up uh, related data and gathering citizens together. Yeah. That's fascinating. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, how? Yeah. Uh, I, interesting uh, from uh, Isabel, a uh, story from Isabel. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I'm Hal Seki from Code for Japan. And Isabel's uh, story reminded me uh, that the, our first pro project of civic tech movement is all, was also a uh, tax visualization project. Yeah, uh, we, we forked uh, that uh, open source uh, visualization project from the uh, uh, Knight, from, uh, sorry, the uh, Open Knowledge Foundation. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, it, it was a coincidence. Uh, and uh, before, uh, sorry, I, I founded Code for Japan in 2013. And I have been working as a software developer for more than uh, 20 years. And uh, I was not interested in solving social problem until that, actually. And, but in March uh, 2011, a massive earthquake uh, hit the Northwest region in Japan. Uh, at that time, I and my friends from the OpenStreetMap community launched the uh, uh, website uh, using open source software uh, that is uh, 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 services, a service for the people who want to know what is happening in Japan, uh, in which region. And gradually I, started, uh, under, uh, gradually, I started understanding how governments uh, lack knowledge about, uh, about technology and local communities are getting weak in Japan uh, because uh, lessening population. And uh, then I started uh, Code for Japan, uh, inspired by Code for America's activities. And uh, one, one of my favorite examples of civic technology is that uh, junior and senior high school students developed a service to connect students and the student council. On, of the school. Uh, students can easily post their ideas uh, to the council members using LINE, a popular messaging, messaging app in Japan, and the ideas are classified by AI and, and, and so that uh, the council members uh, understand what kind of uh, issues or ideas uh, or improvement, improvement uh, were suggested by uh, students. Uh, that was uh, created for the uh, competition uh, that Code for Japan organized 
uh, that it named uh, Civic Tech Challenge Cup uh, under t uh, 22nd. Yeah, that's so all. Uh, that's it's interesting to me that you mentioned an earthquake because um, it makes me wonder about what are the motivations that can get people to contribute to their communities in the way that uh, that you seem to to be doing very well with your respective movements. Um, I think that for someone looking at uh, what you're doing from the from a Western perspective, there's a bit of skepticism that citizens would simply jump into solving solving problems and dedicating their free time on a volunteer basis. So I'm interested in hearing from you, um, from the three of you, what are your motivations? Uh, what, what, what were the incentives for you to join and, and start working on civic technology? And um, how, how I, I'm also interested in, in understanding, because all of you have been working on this for a long time, uh, if these motivations have, have changed over time as well. Maybe I want to share first. Yeah, the motivation is very important and very uh, skeptical, even for me, by myself, because I'm asked by uh, foreign friends that what do I do during my uh, free time during the weekend? And my answers and, and also answers of many Gov Zero participants are, we are just contribute to Gov Zero projects because it's fun for us. It's a good thing to do during your free time, free time because we like to uh, talk to people and discuss the people um, in the community. And with uh, someone like Oh Hyung or Halu um, uh, to do things together. And we find it interesting and meaningful. So um, every time I when we are organize some activities, we try to make it um, easy to participate in. So people can just jump in easily and uh, make it fun. So we provide the food and uh, we have a lot left <laughs> during the events. And you can see from the pictures we took uh, in, in the hack zone, the, in the, facing the ocean, meet and the hack, everybody was so, ha were so happy <laughs> during the event. That's why they will come again and again. And also maybe the most important thing is uh, what we did here is uh, meaningful to all of us. And uh, it's not just for ourselves, Definitely, we learn something in uh, from the uh, community, but it is also uh, helpful to others and uh, have impact to the whole society. Even for the society we did, um, uh, the foreign society like uh, Japan or Korea, which is a uh, very uh, meaningful and uh, give us power to do that again. So it empower uh, the people to join the community again and again. Yes, that's what I found. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Let me add uh, some things. Uh, yeah, for me, the strong motivation is uh, making a friend uh, like this. Uh, we can talk uh, uh, similar, uh, same language uh, you, between the kind of the civic tech movement. So uh, every uh, countries have uh, different uh, issues, or but. Uh, uh, we can uh, that 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 those issues uh, have a uh, similar roots uh, uh, as citizen participation. Uh, so how the challenges of uh, part make a citizen uh, participate participating to uh, something uh, the common issues are, are uh, very uh, important uh, for me and and also uh, just uh, having a. Uh, uh, just just doing uh, similar things together, it makes the uh, uh, bond uh, more stronger. So uh, that kind of the uh, collaboration uh, makes uh, me very uh, happy. And as an engineer, uh, I of of course I have uh, uh, daily jobs, and uh, and but uh, uh, it's it's not a perfect uh, if I only focusing the to my work. Uh, 
as an engineer, I want to contribute to society, and it it is a good, very good place to uh, contribute to some something. Okay, <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> yeah, my motivation, <laughs> uh, my mot motivation is uh, actually I think is for me <laughs> and because. Uh, making a better place uh, and making a better society to me and uh, people like myself so but i have uh, not enough uh, resource and power and time so it's very important uh, to acknowledge that the best way to make a better place for me and us is collaborating together and as a citizen so uh, and with people, meeting people like me and uh, together, we can collaborate lots of projects to uh, make a, a good for us. So uh, it's my motivation to, <laughs> uh, it's the, the best way is to uh, make a society to be good to me is to collaborating people like us. So, and I think one more point is that uh, it's very important moment to uh, we can make a technology to uh, contribute to society or technology to uh, some very small group of people. So uh, I think it's our uh, job as a developer or software engineer to make a technology to be good to society and to all of us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> That's really interesting because uh, in my experience, when I when I first started um, joining uh, a hacktivist group here in my hometown in Brazil, I was motivated by uh, wanting to create a participatory app um, for the city council in my hometown. And then the civic, uh, the hacktivist group was really small and they needed someone to start uh, leading being the brigade captain and I took it on and just wanted to learn more about uh, hacktivism. And what I found and what became my central motivation was the fact that every week I met new people <laughs> and really fun people. But I think that it's, um, that it's hard for people looking who might be watching this to understand why is it that it's fun to be building technology. So, uh, could you, could you like try to, illustrate uh, to to those in the audience who will be listening to this, what is a hack night like and why is it so fun? Yeah, Code for Japan uh, organized a monthly uh, hack, daily hackathon event, uh, not uh, weekly uh, like a hack night, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, two, 20 or 230 uh, people uh, joining to that hackathon event. And 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 they can uh, offer uh, anything they want to do, and gather uh, contributors to their project, and and yeah, uh, and I, I I think the very fun uh, point of the hackathon event is uh, you you can understand the uh, the issues more and by uh, introduced by the uh, the people who are inside the uh, projects or government or any other uh, uh, stakeholders so you you understand well, what is a problem and why this is difficult to solve uh, but uh, you can try also try something uh, to uh, solve that issues uh, by your uh, ideas and and and, and and if if you are not engineers, uh, you can uh, 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 it's okay. You, you you are not engineers uh, because uh, people can uh, people someone who can develop something uh, can create uh, prototypes for that or uh, or something. Uh, designers can also uh, can help that. Uh, and that only one person uh, cannot uh, solve the big issues but uh, uh, gathering uh, people uh, and 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 make a small 
uh, first steps is really uh, good to uh, motivate other people. So, so making that kind of first step is really, really exciting. So, so that's my uh, point of view. This is RxC Voice, an in-house radical exchange creation using quadratic voting that makes democratic decision-making accessible, participatory, and fun.那請三位自我介紹一下 這個城市設計師,喜歡爬政府資料,然後把政府資料變成開放資料。耶。耶。耶。好,那接下來請大家說你心目中居民民社群的安管建制。之後先。直接講三個嘛。嗯。我要先。好。我講完七個。對啊。
其中最隐秘的方式就是，大家有看过那个 Pokemon， 哦 ，Team Up 这一个新的游戏方式，就 Pokemon 他们推出一个新的线上游戏的方式，就是你可以在线上揪团，就是揪在世界各地的揪团组成团队，然后一起打怪。那其实 Dream 就很像这样子的一个游戏，就是你到 Dream 来，你提出你的提案，然后你提出你想要解决的问题，然后大家有兴趣就加加入你的团队，一起揪团打。嗯，对，居里密就是一个纠缠打怪的社群。嗯，赞赞，欢迎。居里密最主要的<笑>呃大活动就是每两个类似的大收，把各领域的人聚集在一起，然后大家一起来发想说，呃，我们要怎么解决我们看到的一些社会问题。所以我觉得居里密是一个。可以让不同领域但是有想法或者想做事的人聚在一起，很好的一个场域。同意，我讲的好。要知道 Dream List 是什么的话，就要先开共笔，<笑>然后在共笔上面问说：“请问大家觉得 Dream List 是什么？”哦、uh, ，嗯，然后就会有人开始涌入你的共笔，开始提供自己的意见。真的吗？你确定不是没有人回答你？<笑>有可能没人回答，人家就收单。先确定就是没有人。哦、oh, ，OK， 就是剧迷就是不要问为什么没有人做这个，嗯、你就是那个没有人。呃、啊，记得在公屏上写那个开开开放授权条款。<笑><笑>对对对对，一定要写，一定要先写好。对对对,对,对。好，好，好。那剧迷咪刚度过九岁生日，你觉得这九年来剧迷咪对于台湾公民社会的影响力是什么？有什么影响？<咳>我觉得，当然有一些专案，他们专案本身的成果是对台湾公民社会有一些影响，比如说像 Whole Facts， 那他当然对就是累积了大量的假新闻的资料库，那事实查核的资料库，所以他也让很多其他的外部的公司他们也可以去用，所以我觉得他们是有一些直接的影响。那呃，比如说像 Dispactory， 那他们他们做违章工厂。在我江工厂这一块也有一些影响，那还有很多很多其他的专案，都曾经对台湾社会有一些具体的影响。那我觉得整个社群的话，就是我觉得就是大家可以动手开干这个这个精神嘛。我觉得有越带越多人知道，在这边你可以找到同伴一起做事。我也觉得，就是让我们这些人想做事的人有地方去，然后可以找到。嗯、不仅是可以找到跟自己就是想做类似事情的人，也可以因为开放授权的关系，也可以不用担心说，今天有一天可能自己换了工作，然后本来的成果没人接，就是嗯，因为开放授权嘛，大家都可以拿去改，大家都可以拿去做。嗯，我觉得最早的有点是走比较呃反政府的社会运动，就是对政府很不满，所以很想要最早我们有就是要拆政府、绝地重建的想法。但是慢慢逐渐，大家都变得，因为呃，政府也越来越多，会想要跟居民做协作，然后也更多公务员也直接参与居民的，所以呃，比起早年的就是比较跟政府对抗对、嗯，现在更多的是公务呃公司一起协力，嗯嗯嗯，就是还蛮多公司协力的案子，嗯，对，对啊，这也是直接就是人民参与政府治理的。一个方式、嗯，然后会 inspire 更多人，就不管是想要进到政府工作，或是持续改善政府，这都不错。嗯，也是民主的这个实践和练习的。对，我觉得就因为有提供一种在投票以外实践民主的方法。嗯嗯嗯，对，因为常投票，你好像投票有点要站立场，尤其是公投的时候，对。就是只有两个选项，你就只有两个选项的时候，你就得要选一边，那就很容易造成对立。嗯、那我觉得 G D P 在很多时候是去寻求某些共识，特别是、嗯、呃，社群里面有讲，就是哦、嗯，粗略的共识晋级的城市，所以就是用提出一个可行的、也许粗略的 solution 的方式来让事情往前走。嗯、对。还有什么要讲的吗？没有，结束了吗？五分钟了吗？拿回去直播。可以。<笑>可以<笑>所以超过五分钟了吗？没有，快七分钟。绝、哦、对超过了。
one of the challenges that I had back in the day when I was working with a hacktivist group was that the majority of people who would come to the meetings were software developers and also men. So I'm wondering if that's still a challenge uh, to have a, a lot of diversity in these groups and if, if it's not, what are some of the tools that you use to make sure that you have a wide variety of uh, people and skills and voices involved in the process of creating digital public infrastructure? Yes, at the first, um, in the early stage of the uh, GovZero community, there are more engineer and software guys in the community, maybe 70%. But for now, we always have help. There are many people who did not code at all, like just like myself. I, I don't know how to code, but I can contribute to projects. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And, uh, um, and also the uh, gender ratio is more balanced now. Um, the governor, the governor Joseon, which I uh, act as the chair, chair uh, since two years ago, uh, we ho hosted uh, bi monthly hackathon um, during the weekend for, for, from 9.30 to 6 p.m. So we will uh, have more than uh, 100 um, participants in the hackathon. And uh, uh, at the first, we, we will have a session for pitches. So um, we if um people can uh, pitch their ideas for the day and um afterwards um the participants can join the 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 project they are interested in uh freely so um during the hackathon we have people from many different domain knowledges so you can meet very interesting people um from non-organization, uh, non-profit organizations, from uh, government, from government, we have uh, government officials to join the hackathons, and uh, um, designers and the scholars. Um, many scholars come to um, come to hackathon and write their papers about the community because it's kind of a um, interesting and very um, um, innovative one, yeah, for them. So um, it's really interesting to meet different people in the hackathons, and uh, the best thing is that you can collaborate with these uh, very good, talented people there, um, who will con we will use their domain knowledge to contribute to the project with you. Um, just like um, uh, we had this new project about Taiwan black bear, which we have this black bear in Taiwan, and uh, they, we want to pr protect the, this species. Um, and uh, they want to try to... Um, the, um, the project owner why want to try uh, want to make a tool for people to report their findings about if they spot a bear in the mountains they can just uh, report it report it to the um, to the foundation and they will uh, just uh, uh, just spot it on the map so people can have a, a better um a knowledge about how these bear act um, and um, when they come to the community we just um, we just um, just uh, people are so because we love these bears so much so <laughs> we want to do something for them so people just uh, a lot of people join the project and uh, they use um, the the other projects tools which is uh, for reporting the illegal factories uh, on the map, they fork the project so they can start it um, the the map for the bear reporting uh, very easily, more easily. So I think the the whole the whole story is very is um very um just a um, meaningful and um, the take when you uh, taking action empower people uh, to do more actions. So um, I I think um, yeah, 
I totally agree with Halusan. Uh, the first day step is very important, and it empower people to do more. Yeah, in Japan case, uh, I think in cultural Japan, uh, tech people ratio is around uh, one third, I think. And initially, we also had uh, many uh, male uh, uh, engineers. Uh, uh, communities, <laughs> but uh, uh, in civic tech, it, it is not enough uh, because uh, the kind of the uh, biases idea uh, won't work. Uh, so, so we uh, invited um, many people, uh, many uh, people from the, for example, from the government or uh, or universities uh, or uh, NPOs. And and yeah, that kind of outreaching reaching is really important to uh, start the actual uh, working uh, prototypes. And also uh, after COVID-19, many young generations joined our communities. Uh, that was really a positive point of the uh, of recent uh, uh, internet uh, connectivities. And, uh, and the students uh, could uh, join. Uh, a student w is able to join our uh, hackathons online, and and also we organized a our, our, uh, our competition, uh, like I said before, uh, that we provided uh, many opportunities to join uh, to 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 our pro our communities. Uh, yeah, and also it's really important to create a safe space for the beginners. So we had uh, we uh, we have a, a, a session for the beginners in start of uh, in the beginnings of the uh, monthly hackathons and uh, let them to know the ideas of the civic tech or and uh, and and answer their questions. In Korea, also we also yeah developers and designers and data analysts and but yeah experts in various fields and civil society activists and government officials are participating together. Uh, even if digital campaign and platform and data collection and analysis is likely to be our final outcome, but uh, we think it is more important to recognize the problem before reaching the outcome. So we like to talk more and learn together in the process of finding the cause and solution. So yeah, well, like uh, Japan and Taiwan, we hold regular meeting and hack king uh, meeting. So we call that meet and hack and focus on creating an environment where uh, many people can talk and learn from each other and around their interests and regardless of their skills. So uh, we using, uh, we are more focusing on talking, <laughs> not to solving. <laughs> so it's our uh, way to make meet more people to come together. Yeah. Because you had, uh, mentioned about motivation, um, actually, I think that you need um, a certain small, maybe small group of people who are committed to organizing these things because um, you still need organizers in the community who will take responsibility to do it once and one and one uh, again and again, just like uh, Hado San, the Oh Hyun and uh, some organizer in the European community, we have to do it repeatedly to keep the momentum of the whole community. So even people say that our Gavdiro community is very uh, organic and the people can come and go freely, but actually there are some small, there are some people who stick to the com uh, committed to these things and uh, they spend a lot of times uh, their free time to do to organizing the event. Yeah. So I think it's uh, essential to to have the, to keep things going. Yes, definitely. And what are some of the resources that someone wanting to start organizing a activist group in their own hometown uh, can 
can tap on to just learn about how to do it? I would say, um, first, you, find, you need to find your partners because it's difficult to do it by yourself. It's not a thing that you can do for one person. Yeah, if you have partners for well, like maybe two or three of them, and you have uh, you you share the same value and the the same way to do things together, um, just like we have this uh uh cons- this uh these ideas of o- open source model in GovDev community. So we we share open source uh cultural value, so we can do things co- um in this way. So the first thing is uh, you need to find your partners who share the same value with you. And uh, maybe you can find some, there are a lot of different models you can learn from uh, these communities uh, all, all around the world. You Yeah. So just start with uh, maybe small events and uh, which would, would not cost a lot, a lot of uh, resources. So you just need to find the uh, uh, spaces and maybe have some food for people. And um, then you need to reach out for people who are interested in this. So just uh, find partners and uh, uh, try try the first one and see what happens next. Yeah. And food. Yeah, the food, food. is important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I would Japan. say the food is totally yeah. broad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah. In in Japan, the there uh, there were uh, there are uh, uh, regional uh, code for communities uh, around uh, around eighty uh, cities uh, that uh, they are uh, working. And, and and it is totally in, independent uh, organization, uh, and so 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 different from the code for Japan. So there are code for Osaka, code for Kyoto, or code for Sapporo, and and we uh, we have a, a event uh, for sharing their uh, experiences uh, together. Uh, we hold a um, yearly annual event. Uh, called uh, Code for Japan Summit, so they can learn from each other. Yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, I think uh, <laughs> uh, if you want to start your civic hacking community, uh, I think uh, just to start your own project with your friends and sharing uh, uh, to many people and let them know, notice that project. And, and I think it's very important to keep uh, your own motivation and keep uh, until uh, citizen or uh, other people acknowledge it. And so I think start your own project and with your <laughs> friends and have some fun with that project. I think it's very good. Wonderful. Um, yeah. So now I'm interested in hearing from you. Uh, how is your relationship with your with the government institutions and the government officials that come to join your meetings? And what are the ways in which you think that uh, Code for Korea, Code for Japan, and uh, GovZero have um, influenced or or shaped or changed uh, government? Not only in specific policies, but also in practices relating to open data and um, participatory processes. As I said, uh, in Japan, there are many local uh, code for communities uh, are working, and they are have they also, uh, often have uh, uh, meetups with uh, government officials and talk uh, about uh, local programs and also how to you uh, talk of uh, exchange ideas uh, about how to. Uh, utilize the open data and uh, and sometimes they create some uh, tools for uh, solving the local issues that kind of uh, close communication and uh, and and collaboration project is really useful for showing what uh, can be done and, and so showing some uh, small steps is really important to uh, 
to cultivate the trust with the uh, different uh, stakeholders. So also, I uh, code, as a code for Japan, we had, we organized a, a workshop, uh, workshops for the local government officials and to how to utilize uh, data uh, inside, uh, inside the city hall and for improving their, uh, their uh, jobs. And so, so we are we can are we uh, providing uh, the uh, kind of the uh, consultation program for the government so that we can understand uh, deeply uh, the, from the inside of the city hall. So we so so that we we can speak the uh, same languages with. Uh, uh, with the local government officials, that's really important to uh, so uh, to to create the sustainable uh, projects. Yeah, and also we have uh, Slack channels uh, for the uh, with the local government officials, so they can they can uh, show up uh, as uh, uh, as uh, uh, individually. So it's not uh, our, our part of the government. So yeah, uh, creating the connection between the uh, many uh, people with uh, with uh, casual tools is also helpful. And did, did you feel like there was a resistance in the beginning when you first started uh, working oh. with people in government? Yeah, so, some some city some lo some government officials uh, can't understand this kind of collaboration models so we yeah it, sometimes it's difficult to uh, to keep uh, friendship with uh, such kind of the uh, person and what are some of the ways uh, that have worked for you to overcome mm -hmm. this these barriers mm -hmm. Starting from the people who can help us, <laughs> not uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, not uh, not fight <laughs> to such kind of the uh, opposite side of people. So we we have lack of na uh, resources to to uh, to start from hard things. So yeah. so. Let aside, Keep it aside. Simple. Yeah. <laughs> and, and and but uh, you, if we we create some something uh, for for the cities or uh, issues uh, and maybe uh, they can understand uh, what is possible. So after that, we also also uh, we uh, talk again with that prototype. So maybe it it work. So in a sense, um, the fact that you're not just talking or trying to create a relationship, but building something, offering something. Yeah, is yeah, right, right. Helpful. Mm, in Korea, as you know, uh, Korea has been developed too rapidly and uh, led by government and business sector. So since then, uh, the role of citizens has been expanded through the uh, democratic movements and various social movements. So the Korean government has gone through the, the same process, I think, and recognized that it is very uh, important task to cooperate with the citizens and create a space where citizens can uh, voluntarily and proactively act. So in particular, the government knew that the core, core of uh, digital society are based on um, public, public goods and lies in cooperation with the citizens and citizen initiative. But recently, it seems that um, uh, methods such as civic hackers and uh, living depths and or open data uh, are effective, I, th I think they think. So, uh, so we requested uh, COVID-19 data and uh, mask, the mask inventory data and created uh, an apps with citizens and uh, after that, we created a way to protect privacy data and collect uh, entrance uh, information, uh, which is introduced to Kakao and Line Messenger app. And 
uh, we requested the disclosing uh, public official property information and carbon neutral policy data uh, as a machine readable data. And uh, we are preparing dashboard services now. And, uh, and also we are preparing a campaign to commemorate the, the victims of social disasters or to collect and process data of those who died from industrial accidents and deliver them, deliver that data to a uh, related activists uh, or NGO. And so the governments uh, expect to ask uh, our work and methodology to spread to, to more citizen and civil society. Uh, as I said, uh, currently the government has now uh, created um, some space um, where if there is a problem, uh, they should open data first and to make gather citizens to collaborate. So uh, now co our government wants to us to join more actively to government committees and or lots of events. So we also try to our members to <laughs> send their committees and uh, sharing and learning uh, the ways of collaborating with the governments and together. So I think uh, as uh, Hal said, uh, uh, first is first thing is making them government understand who we are and what we want, and uh, and next building some trust uh, between government and citizen together. And I think it's very important to task to deal uh, up. Thank you. <laughs> That's really encouraging to hear. I want to know how what are the ways in which uh, Gov Zero. Code for Korea and Code for Japan are collaborating today. What are the ways in which you think that the hacktivist movements in East Asia are similar or different from um, other hacktivist movements in, in other parts of the world? I think, yeah, through the Facing Ocean community, I think, yeah, we, uh, I think, yeah, we, I, we can feel the support from uh, friends from other country and lots of information we shared and as you know mask uh, app and cases is from taiwan and we can um, uh, adopt our in country together and we can persuade the government people to yeah yes we can <laughs> because there are some cases so and i think yeah and one more most important thing is to in sharing some uh uh, support and uh, some uh, uh, background. Uh, you know, we, we are a very strong community in global yeah, networking and lots of experience already. Uh, it's very uh, important to us in local uh, government. And and as a civic actor, I think it's very uh, in East Asia. Uh, and I have family in Japan and I live in and working Korea. So, uh, but as you know, East Asia has very <laughs> active and <laughs> geological political problems, lots of problems. So I think uh, for for the next generation, uh, we should uh, keep this you know, civic network is very important to uh, in small uh, East Asia sector, I think, yeah. Next, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I think we began this uh, facing the ocean meet and hack because uh, we met each other several times before we started that project, um, this event, this uh, facing the ocean com community. But at the conferences, we only have a uh, talk, but um, we did not collaborate into something together. There is a saying in GovDero community or in open source communities that show me the code, code, not just code, talk, show me the code. So, which is not quite right for us just talking without collaboration. So that's why we started uh, this meet and hack um, event. And so we want to build up a network which we can actually uh, doing something together. And uh, so we have this uh, three times uh, hack zones already, meet and hack already. And I think there is a small network in, in 
uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and uh, Japan. So we can share experiences together. And uh, there are also um, collaborative uh, projects like uh, Her Stories, which is a project um, um, contributors from different countries um, provide their uh, stories about gender issues on the same page, on the same map and uh, a timeline. So we can, we can understand um, what happened in the in different countries in East Asia. And we, we are trying to um, um, share the experience about disinformation because uh, which is a very um, difficult issue to solve um, in all around the world. But we, we have these uh, experiences in, in Taiwan and we have um, uh, many uh, projects about this. So we can share experiences with uh, Kofo Japan and Kofo Korea and um, so, um, and also we we want to bring our young generation together. Like we have uh, educational um, projects, uh, so we will we want to invite uh, students or young people from Japan and Korea to Taiwan when we can travel again. <laughs> yeah, so they can collaborate t t together. Yeah, so I think the, this um, um, network is very important for Taiwan because uh, we, you know, we don't have an official rela relationship with uh, Japan or South Korea. So that's what we can do from the um, for for Taiwan from the civic civic uh, society um, here. So it's important for for Taiwanese to do to do this. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let me add something. So I feel we are friends that study democracies in each country. Yeah, it's hard journey and no obvious goals, but we can learn from each other. That's really important. And also, so many examples from other countries makes us motivated to keep working working on uh, th those challenges and the, so we are not alone uh, i feel so and our partnership helped make our government more open because i can introduce other countries uh, use cases to the government yes yes totally yeah. It, yeah yeah it's yeah, yeah. really <laughs> funny uh, audrey towns big town became our superstar in japan <laughs> Uh, yeah, that kind of yeah, the collaboration is, uh, helps a lot. Oh, it, it also helps, I think, for for government officials to know that this is already being implemented in in another country, because it gives them a sense of security that they are not the ones who are trying something very new, very scary, or too innovative. And then it can become a bit of a competition of who is the most open, who is the most innovative. So that can be interesting as well. One thing that I've noticed is that in the mission statement of the Code for All Network, it's written that one of the aims is to improve the relationship between government and people. And whereas in, in the Gov Zero manifesto, um, it's written that uh, you hope to improve civil society. So I wonder if that uh, distinction uh, between focusing on, on government and fo focusing on civil society manifests in some uh, concrete ways in the way that you approach your work. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think um, um, I like the energy about, um, of the three pillows. So you need three pillows um, to make the balance um, in a society, which is civil, civil society and um, a community and the government and the market. So I think Gavdiro, um is um, working on, as a community, it is working, uh, built up their own muscles to be strong enough so he can take um, uh, their part in their role in the society, which will sometimes uh, pu push a uh, government to do something. So I think it's not that different from what uh, 
COPO will want to do. It's um I think it's a uh, the same goal but different approaches. Yeah. So actually, GovZero is also part a member of COPO network. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's um what what I see. We don't focusing on uh improving the relationships, but we um focusing more on um on improving the energy and keep the momentum of the society, the uh the civic the community and the whole society. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Code for Japan's vision is uh, to uh, to create a uh, environment for the people who want to think together and create together. So so that's really important to create the space. And our uh, value is uh, we we have three values of the Code for Japan, and uh, one is uh, uh, beyond all borders. So we have to cross our borders, and 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 it's important to have a diversity. And second is uh, uh, open source minded. So we can uh, we have to uh, open our activities, and also of course the source code of is should be uh, available, but uh, uh, the challenges itself uh, should be uh, openly uh, shared with others. And and third is uh, uh, be a uh, uh, first penguin and the agile flippers and I uh, like uh, penguin uh, and we can uh, put, uh, we can uh, first uh, move to to and jump into the, to the ocean and after that we can uh, uh, use our uh, our flip uh, so 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 that we can uh, rapidly uh, move in. Uh, yeah, in Korea, I don't. I think that uh, civil society and governments are not that dis, not that different. I think so, but uh, in Korea, the Code for Korea is more focusing on uh, our civic hacking community as a citizens. But I think also government is important to very important to our society, and uh, actually government is belongs to us or yeah, so citizens. So. Uh, first, I think building, uh, building and expanding common area between government and citizens is very important, uh, and so to keep that, uh, so uh, is our own uh, civic hacking area sector is also very crucial. I think so. We are focusing on to uh, building and expanding common area and building on our own community is our focus now. Yeah. What you, what you mentioned is interesting because I think one of the key uh, aspects of uh, hacktivist movements is the sense that um, participants take ownership uh, over their government. They don't see government as something that is external and that kind of can't be touched or something that you pay taxes for and you want to receive these services in return. And the sense of... Uh, of ownership is really empowering and transformative and, and it's really the essence of what can make a democratic government work uh, well. So I'm curious to hear from you, where do you think uh, that comes from and how is it that we can instill this sense of ownership more broadly to more people? Yeah, the idea of the ownership is really important because um, um, to my point of view, we cannot just uh, stay there and waiting for the government to to solve our problems. Yeah, because um, it's even more difficult for the government to do so, because with the the innovation of the technologies, the uh, the civic society may have more knowledge and ability to do things um, with efficiency. That's why uh, the Gov Zero community started. We want to uh, we substitute the O in the government, the word Gov, with uh, zero, which means uh, we want to use the zero and O digital tools to um, to solve the problems. So the 
the original idea is to fork the government as a gov zero community. What the government cannot do, we were trying to find a way to do it. So that's um yeah, that's uh, the 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 original I idea of gov zero community. So, that, so that's a we, really that's a it's interesting to me. I'm I'm, I'm coming here. Because I think that a lot of people, when they're frustrated with their government, they don't think, you know, let's fork it. They they think about other ways to to protest. Yeah, protest or yeah, protest or complaints or criticize. But these things cannot solve the problem, right? You need to find a solution. That's why we we have these uh, uh, very uh, important ideas in gov zero community is so we are proactive. You cannot just stay there to to wait someone else to uh, solve your uh, problems. Um, there is a motto in gov zero community, uh, ask not why nobody uh, doing this. You are the nobody. So because you are nobody is working on this, you can be the nobody who work trying who work on this and try to find the possible solutions, right? So it's more, um, I would say it's um, action will um, will release people from anxiety. You know, if it, if it during the uh, during the COVID nineteen. There are so many people join uh, the Gov Zero community because they want to do something, because they they worry about the situation. But when they can take actions, they feel better. They release their the intensity. So I think it's um very healthy for for the whole community when you take the ownership of these problems and trying to find a, a solution uh, together and. The, it creates the uh, uh, solidarity in 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 the the society. So um, yeah, that's what I see in 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 Gov Zero. Uh, yeah, in my experience, I think uh, sense of ownership is coming from the small experience to collaborate and some recognition from society. So I think. Uh, it's good idea to start from your own problem, and uh, that problem cannot be solved by your own. So collaborate with other citizens, and I think there, I believe there are always some other citizens who want to solve the problem together, or in government, company, or NGO everywhere. So somewhere, so collaborate with that uh, other citizens and. Next time in government and society, when uh, government and society recognize your work and people uh, have something feeling that uh, we can make change together and uh, this is our work for society. So that sense of uh, some small experience are very important, I think. Uh, so starting from small experience and uh, from uh, some recognition from society and other citizens is very is always I think worked I think. <clears throat> Wonderful, how Ohio and, and Isabel, thank you so much for sharing your work. We talk a lot about civic technology, but really the crucial component I think is the work that all of you are doing, which is building the social infrastructure through which people can come together and form community around solving their shared challenges. So thank you so much for being with us today and I hope that you have a great day. Thank you, Bola. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye -bye. Yeah. See you Bye -bye. soon. Yeah. Bye. See you See soon. You. In Jeju. Yeah. In Jeju. Yeah. <laughs>
because democracy is an ancient concept that goes back to the ancient Athens, but digital is much more recent. But in Taiwan, the internet and democracy began literally at the same year. To me, democracy means working with the people, not just for the people. And digital democracy is a way for us to transcend the time and space boundaries, so people around the globe in different time zones can also make decisions together. In Taiwan, we countered the pandemic with no lockdown and countered the infodemic with no takedowns. If the technologies are controlled in the hands of a few, then people feel less and less empowered when it concerns issues of common interest. For example, rationing out masks. Uh, tracing the contacts of infected people or distributing vaccines in a fair way, we need open innovations from around all the corners of our society and the world in order to make it fast, fair, and fun. So a democracy that's fast, fair, and fun need to scale using the help of digital technologies. In Taiwan, our first presidential election was in 1996, and that was also the year that the wild web became really popular in Taiwan. So internet and democracy. Democracy in Taiwan are not two things, but rather one and the same thing, just like bubble and tea, that could be mixed together in any which way. Because in many ancient republics and democracies, people think of democracy as something that's fixed, like uploading three bits of information every person every four years, called voting. But because in Taiwan, democratization. Takes place on the internet, so we have higher bandwidth of democracy, of participatory budgeting, of sandbox applications, presidential hackathon, citizens' initiatives, so on and so forth. I believe that bubble tea represents the spirit of open innovation. It could be white tapioca bowl, black tapioca bowl. It could be red tea. It could be any kind of tea, really.、Uh, but as long as they're mixed together, it gives rise to creativity and enjoyment around the world. And people can adapt this open innovation without fear of being sued、uh, by patents or copyright or trademark losses. And that means that uh, uh, innovation is very easy to make from the front line to、uh, empower people closest to the pain or. To the thirst, as it were,、uh, and people can make their own recipes and freely share it around the world, and that's the spirit of Taiwanese digital democracy. When I was a child, Taiwan was still under the martial law, and indeed we relied on international correspondence in, for example, Hong Kong, to report the human rights violations during Taiwan's martial law era, and also to strategize on how to change Taiwan for the better. Now, fast forward to today. Of course, we've been ranked as the most open and democratic society in our corner of the world. So it's our turn to provide this international stage for people, per perhaps in Hong Kong, perhaps now moved to Taiwan, to voice their concerns about the backsliding of democracy in their regions, about the worry that authoritarianism may take over, and strategize with people around the world to make sure that the democratic polities work together to advance, not just defend democracy. As I said in the Oslo Freedom Forum, ring the bells that still can ring. Forget our perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. While it's true that democracy is facing some of its greatest challenges yet, we hope that the creative individuals, teams, and civic technologies we explored today have left you inspired to dive in and help develop these tools and contribute to these communities 
working to make a radically egalitarian and participatory future within reach. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned next week for the following program on December 9th. This is Radical Exchange, a new era of democracy. So um, we're partway throughout the song, uh, and i like just to use this opportunity to highlight that uh, this is only possible because of the citizens' contribution. So Taiwan actually sees democracy as a strength, not a weakness, when countering the pandemic. And I think Freddie's uh, opening speech here, greeting the people of Takao, of Kaohsiung, is actually one of the main ideas. Uh, with the people's participation, we can enjoy this kind of all of society response. And the technological applications, too. In Taiwan, um, many people know that we've got the mask rationing system, uh, nowadays the vaccination, and so on. And all of that are empowered by people developing their code uh, to deploy and to make sure that it runs more smoothly. Yes, and there have also been so many online live broadcasts during the epidemic in all the countries, in different countries. So, but for me, the real live performances that can connect with thousands of fans are still irreplaceable. Yeah, I really like how Freddie greeted people first uh, in the field, but then uh, from afar, <laughs> online people. So it's obviously that in Taiwan, uh, we're now living in a kind of hybrid times. To connect to our international friends, of course, we cannot travel freely just yet. But on the other hand, in Taiwan, we all are very happy to share what we are experiencing as a kind of vision of a post-COVID life uh, with people around the world and also share what we have learned in 2003 during the SARS pandemic uh, that we turned into the Central Epidemic Command Center in 2004 that enabled us to counter the pandemic so successfully. We're also happy to help out to everyone around the world to build such an institution after the COVID-19 pandemic. And hopefully that the, the fans and audience can still remember how it feels like to connect with people in such, such kind of uh, mass event. Uh, I think that's something very uh, mean, means a lot to a lot of people, especially the music fans. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. The I think Freddie talked just about the importance of solidarity uh, for all the people, not just Taiwanese people, but also the resolve uh, to overcome this uh, together. I think that's that's really well put. Yeah. So Freddie is now saying the world's watching. <laughs> And we'll make it a live video. Yeah.